there is a certain fish I've always wanted to track down. When I was a child, I got this incredible book, and ever since seeing the mysterious fish on this book's cover, I've been very eager to find one in the wild. But I didn't think it was possible. I didn't think I'd ever find a fish that had a colour as vibrant as the one on the cover of this book. So we went on a three day journey to try and find one because we heard that there's a place somewhere north of Brisbane where we might be able to find one. So come along on this adventure as we try and track down the ornate rainbow fish. And here is that book. And on its cover, you can see the ornate rainbow fish. This book has so much great information in it, but it's very hard to come by these days. It's got lots of information about Australia's freshwater and saltwater creatures and the general areas where they're found. And then it's got these great photos in it as well. And here's the ornate rainbow. Look at how colourful it is. And also its distribution. It's only found in southeast Queensland and northern New South Wales. There's a unique species of rainbow fish called the ornate rainbow fish that's only found in this area. We're east of Gympie, which is in southeast Queensland, but it's in the north point of southeast Queensland, and on the other side of this ridge is the ocean. So let's have a look at what could be in this creek. We went a fair way down this creek, and this creek had a really strong current. And there's my guide. He was gonna float down the creek and film what he saw further down because it got a bit deeper and I didn't feel like swimming all the way down the creek. All he had to do was lift his legs and he got swept down the creek really quickly. And then he came across this crayfish. All known Queensland species belong to three genera. The Cherax, known as the smooth freshwater crayfish or freshwater the yabbies. The Eustachus, known as the spiny freshwater crayfish. And the Tenu Branchurus, known as the Swamp Crayfish. I'm guessing this little guy is from the Cherax group. We found lots of these little guys along our adventure. None of them were more than 10 centimeters long, which is quite a lot smaller than the spiny crayfish we found in our video, the giant endangered lamington spiny crayfish. And these little crays were very dark in color, almost black or a very dark brown. They also hold their eggs underneath their little tails until their eggs have hatched and the babies are big enough to fend for themselves. But it wasn't long until we came across the ornate rainbow fish. And here are some particularly nice examples of the ornate rainbow fish. Now all the literature I found about the ornate rainbows said that they like to stay in slow moving creeks. But this creek was really fast flowing and although they liked to hang out in the sides where the water wasn't quite as quick, they had no trouble swimming across this really quick current. The ornate rainbow fish is a smaller species of rainbow, only getting to a max size of about 10 centimeters. But more commonly, they're around six centimeters in the wild. The species is mainly restricted to coastal wallum habitats of Eastern Australia. And Wallum is a typically sandy, often tannin-stained creek or a marshy swamp. They were originally collected from a freshwater stream on Morton Island, which is a sand dune island near Brisbane. They were also first described in 1914 by a man at the British Natural History Museum. They are the only species recognised within their genus. They can vary a lot in body colour and even the patterns depending on the region they're found in. Their bodies are usually blue or light brown, but some males, as you can see, get a really bright orangey colour on their back end. However, all the species have a scattered iridescent neon blue spots on their bodies. And there it is, a colourful rainbow just like the one on the cover of my book. This has been a goal of mine ever since I was a child, but I didn't think I'd ever come across one as colourful as that. I'm so pleased that we managed to find one. As you can see, 
these trees have been charred by a recent fire that came through in the summer. But fires are actually beneficial for Australian trees because it clears the vegetation nearby and allows the seed pods of the Australian natives to open up, releasing their seeds, and there'll be no plants nearby to outcompete them. These plants that you can see around me haven't been here for that long, and they'll no doubt get cleared out when another fire comes through. But that will allow these trees and other Australian trees to open up their seed pods and be able to grow and continue on for more generations. And these trees are called banksias, and banksias will only open their seed pods when it gets hot enough from a fire. That's a pretty amazing adaptation. Look at this amazing seed pod. It looks almost like tiny little mussels that have attached themselves to a rock, except this is a seed pod of an Australian native tree. This tree is completely charred and all of its seed pods are opened, which means the fire must have been very hot in this particular area. And the banksias are a slower growing tree, so they do require the nearby land to be cleared from any plants that might compete with them for space. You can see the seed pods around this one have all opened up and released their seeds, but this particular one hasn't. And that's possibly because the fire didn't get hot enough in this particular area for this seed pod to open up and release its seeds. Yeah, you can see that one's still closed and that's because there's no signs of any burning on that particular seed pod. Now let's get back to the ornate rainbows. We found so many ornate rainbows, which was such a good thing. The reason we found so many is because this creek is remote and is protected so no one can fish here which may, means that this particular population has managed to do well. We didn't find any non-native invasive species in here either. While not a lot is known about how the ornate rainbows behave in the wild, from what people have observed in aquariums, the males tend to defend a small territory by chasing away rival males and displaying their colorful fins to the females. If the females are impressed, they will spawn three to five eggs per day, up to a maximum of about 80 eggs, which the male then fertilizes. The eggs take around 10 days to hatch. Ornate rainbows consume a wide range of foods, such as insects, microorganisms, algae, pollen, and occasionally seeds. The greatest threat to the ornate rainbow is humans. The populations near urban developments eventually disappear, leaving only a few locations where these incredible fish can be found. Another problem is invasive species, as they will outcompete the rainbow fish. And you can see there's some really colourful males here, just like the one on the cover of my book. But not all of them are colourful, some of them just have the little black stripes or a little bit of blue in their fins. So it's interesting seeing how much these fish can vary in color and also how they're able to keep up with a really strong current. It's a strange environment because it looks almost like we're in the sea. There's sand everywhere and there's lots of algae and and plants that look like they belong in the sea. But this is totally fresh water where we are at the moment, although we are quite close to the ocean. There's so many schools of these beautiful rainbows. I never thought I'd come across them, but I'm so pleased that we finally found where they live and got to film some of them. You can see they're not really bothered by me walking through here at all. They're happy to swim up in front of the camera, but they're so fast moving, it was really hard to get a good, clear shot of them.
We are deep in Creek now, and I can't believe the range of flora and fauna that we've found. We found the ornate rainbow fish, but we've also found lots of eels and crayfish and gudgeons living in this creek. The water is surprisingly cold here. It feels like water from your fridge. We're not sure how cold exactly, but it's cold. The riverbanks are particularly unique as well because they're only made out of sand, but they hold their structure. And that must be from the plants growing above the water, retaining that sand and giving the, plate, uh, the fish and the plants a place to live. And it makes an ideal environment for the ornate rainbows because they get a nice little patch of slower moving water near the banks where they can hide out and they can lay their eggs. And here's another crayfish. Every time I got near the crayfish, they tended to zoom away. Why does a plant need to have leaves this spiky? This must be an ancient species of plant and it must have had some predator in the past that liked to eat its leaves that it wanted to put off with these spikes. That is one spiky plant. And there's another one of these awesome little crayfish. But once again, they didn't want to be on camera so they moved away quite quickly. You might have seen red claw crayfish before and they're also from the genera Cherax. So they look quite similar to these guys. And there was also these quite interesting structures from where the wood had fallen over and algae had grown on them. But it looked almost like coral. Made it look even more like we were in the ocean. But totally fresh water. And there's a male with just his tail turning orange rather than the whole back half of his body. Just so much variation in this species. There's another little crayfish. Off he goes. These species are called Western Carp Gudgeons. And here's one of the gudgeons we came across. They're quite similar looking to firetail gudgeons, but the redness is on the bottom of their fins rather than on the top. And they also have little spots going down their bodies like a purple spotted gudgeon. But we didn't get to see many of them because they zoomed away so quickly, they did not want to be on camera. There are also lots of spider webs along here. It's a perfect environment for the spiders because they'll be able to catch any insects that are going down near the water. And you can see lots of algae growing along these banks. There wasn't a whole lot of freshwater plants, but there was so much algae growing. And then we came across this amazing creature called a long fin eel. And long fin eels spend their lives in fresh water. And they can live for a very long time, sometimes up to 70 years in a freshwater environment before they decide it's time to finish their life cycle and go off to the ocean. No one has ever seen a fully grown eel in the ocean, but we know that they go out to somewhere near New Caledonia and breed. Another strange thing is that they don't have any sexual organs when they're in their freshwater phase, but they grow them when they get into the ocean. And all the species on Australia's east coast and New Zealand and the surrounding islands go somewhere near New Caledonia to breed. And then when they're tiny little eels, they're called glass eels. And then when they get a bit bigger, they're called elvers. And the elvers will swim up the streams and find their new homes somewhere in a freshwater environment. No one knows how they determine what rivers to go up and they're a very mysterious creature. And here's a gudgeon. These are called striped gudgeons. And I tried to get a good look at this one, but he was just out of my range. 
And every time I got closer to him, he just zoomed further and further away. So this is the best look we could get at the striped gudgeon. Also, some people came around the corner right at this moment and scared him away. And just every corner we went around, there was more and more ornate rainbow fish. It was time to move further up the creek and see what could be living on the other side of this bridge. So we walked under this bridge through the still flowing creek and then we came out the other side and saw some really deep water. On the bridge was the information of the people who built it and when it was made. So let's have a look at what could be in this part of the creek. And here's another long fin eel. There's two main species of eel we'll find in Australia, the long fin and the short fin, and both of them have that unique life cycle of going into the ocean to breed, but living their lives in fresh water. They can live for a long time out of water as well. They can go two days out of water and they can climb across the land very easily. They can also swim as fast backwards as they can forwards. Here's a cool species of plant. It's a fairly ancient looking species and I don't think you'll find many plants with leaves quite like this one. It's time to get going now, so we headed back through the tunnel to our car to continue on searching for cool species. I hope you enjoyed learning about the ornate rainbow fish and the other creatures that live in its environment. We'll see you on our next adventure and keep it murky.